Good morning. Our first reading is from Psalm 48, verses 1 to 3 and 9 to 14. Great is the ageless God and greatly praised. In the city of our God is God's holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, is the city of the great sovereign. Within her citadels, God has made herself known as a bulwark. We contemplate your faithful love, God, in the midst of your temple. Like your name, God, your, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Go about Zion, go all around her, count her towers. Set your hearts upon her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may recount to the next generation. For this God is our God, our God forever and ever. She will be our guide until we die. And the second reading is from John chapter 2, verses 14 to 22. In the temple, Jesus found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple, including the sheep and the cattle. Jesus also poured out the coins of the money changers and threw over their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these out of here. Stop making the house of my Abba a house of commerce. His disciples remembered what, that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the other Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They then said, for 46 years, this temple, this temple has been under construction and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God bless the reading of these words to our understanding. Fine, if it's going to be like that, we'll just do this. <laughs> Whenever we're ready. It's always fight. You never try to fight with the organ because the organ will always win. He did what? 
There's a hymn by Charles Wesley which begins, Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Or maybe not so meek and not so mild and not so gentle at times. There's a place for gentleness and meekness and mildness. There's a place for making a whip of cords and causing ruckus. I think we forget that, especially those of us who are part of a dominant culture, those of us who aren't living on the margins. In every major civil rights demonstration over the last 70 years, there's been voices, often white, often from the church, who said, well, do they really have to take this march in the streets? Can't they just write letters and advocate for things in a quieter, gentler way? Do they have to block highways? Do they have to go into pipeline building camps and disrupt what's going on? Sometimes there's a place to make a fuss. Sometimes there's a place to cause trouble. Thinking of the late civil rights leader in the U.S. who always encouraged people to make good trouble. I think Jesus understands this. It's odd, this story. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the story is what prompts the authorities to say, okay, that's enough. It happens at the end of Jesus' ministry. And it's what prompts them to say, okay, he's getting out of hand. This Jesus must die. But John puts it at the beginning, at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Just before this is the story we're going to hear next week because of why tell stories in order? Of the wedding at Cana, which is Jesus' first miracle in John. But this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And in John, Jesus goes to Jerusalem three times. This is his first trip to Jerusalem. And he begins it by causing a fuss. He begins it by saying, you've got it wrong. You're focusing on the wrong stuff. You're getting in the way of people being able to come and commune with God. I think putting that at the beginning of the story says something about the priorities. The priority isn't ritual. Or making the sacrifice the right way. Or even having the right coinage. The priority is how do we open space for people to commune with God. And when you follow Jesus through, you find that having the space to commune with God transforms us so that we stand up for justice. We cry out for a change. We work together to build the kingdom of God, which Jesus says is real and among us at the start of his story. Jesus was all about that building of the kingdom of God, and he knew that to do that, you had to upset a few tables. He knew that to do that, you couldn't just be nice and write letters to the, to the editor. I assume they had letters to the editor in the first century, although I'm not sure they had newspapers, so maybe they didn't. Sometimes you have to turn the world upside down, flip things around. It's a challenge for those of us who were raised saying, no, it's, be it's better to be nice. Who were raised to be, don't make too much of a fuss. I mean, even now, in the last ra wave of Black Lives Matter, there were still voices, mainly white and often from the church, saying, Really, is this the best way to do it? 
there were still voices, mainly white and often from the church, saying, oh, no, they're just a bunch of rioters. Not as much as once was. The church is getting a bit better sense of the fact that sometimes we need to make a fuss. He did what? I can just imagine. In John's Gospel, Jesus' mother is present in the story right before this. He did what? I didn't raise him to be a troublemaker. He did what? Sometimes we have to take to the streets. Sometimes we have to to get mad. Many years ago, when I first started seminary, I was encouraged to read an article. I can't remember if I actually read it. And if I did read it, I can't remember what it said. But the title has always stuck with me. The Power of Anger in the Work of Love. The Power of Anger in the Work of Love. The Power of Anger in the Work of Building God's Kingdom. Anger can be terribly destructive. It can be lived out in ways that destroy relationship and break people down. But anger, passion, can be powerful tools for us to stand up and say, you've got it wrong, you've got the priorities wrong, you're doing things the wrong way. That, I believe, is what we see Jesus doing as he stands in the temple and he makes a whip of cords and drives out the animals and the money changers and flips over tables. He's filled with passion for what could be in this place. And he's seeing something totally different and he has to make a change. What makes us passionate? What would fill us with that anger and the work of love? Anger and the service of the kingdom? That we just simply have to stand up and make a fuss? I don't think the answer is the same for all of us. I don't think the answer needs to be the same for all of us. But I do think we need to open ourselves to the possibility that we don't always have to be nice and quiet. Sometimes we can be loud. Sometimes we can rage. Maybe even flip over a few tables as we work together to build that space we call the kingdom of God. May God help us to do so.